Yo, yo, guys. So, give it a second. We got dealing with some Facebook issues here. Trying to get Billy in. Coach Dan, what's up? What's up, buddy? Good to see you, brother. Yeah, Dan, we were at uh, Sesame Place yesterday, buddy. So that's why uh, didn't get back to you. Finchy, what's up? What's up, buddy? Here's the recovery. Good to see you, man. What up? What up? Good morning. Good morning, morning. If you guys could share out, that'd be awesome. Mm. Let me see if uh, Joe saw what Make up, sure what up again. Too. Yeah. Let me get that out there, guys. Put it out. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Show going up. Billy, let's see if we can get him in now. Should be able to. Billy, yep. Awesome. And let's see. And. Yes, it is, Coach Dan. You know it, brother. You know it. So we went to. Too far back. How are we doing? All right. We got it. <laughs> now. Forget it, like, yeah. <laughs> you got me? You, you got oh, no, you good. Yeah. Can you hear me? We just have bison head over here. And I got a freaking. <laughs> and I've got, like, we all can't have a beautiful head of hair bob, like you, Vince. It's just going to be my hair. It's going to be like cutting it. Just there. <laughs> Let me get on the page, buddy. Uh, let's see. I'm tagging you in my. You're tagging? Well, I'm trying. Not letting you. Oh, what's over there? Hi, guys. Hi. All right. Just putting this there. Let's show this out. Let me get on. Let's... Oh, yeah. Obviously. Yes. Look, we got um, 13 people and we're just looking at our phones, talking know. to ourselves. <laughs> Billy, can you hear us okay? Yeah, I got you, Marissa. Nice. I'm like, why is the C backwards? And then I just realized it's just like. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <flipped. laughs> nice. All we're right. gonna have to really smush in here. Yeah, we are. We're, so we're so looking forward to that today. <laughs> we're having one of those marital moments before the show. Yes. Oh, there you go. Be <laughs> sitting this tight so right now. That could be a show in itself. <laughs> I can't uh, hear anything. Roll here. time. <laughs> What's up? What's up? Is this loud? Can you hear us? Yeah, I've got you. Yeah, it's good. It's coming through. Okay. Beauty. All right. So I think we're going that part. So how are we doing, Coach? Doing well, guys. Appreciate uh, – thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure, buddy. Pumped to have this uh, – get this interview going, obviously. Um, we'd love for you to start off a little bit, your background and all that other fun stuff to get things going just so people understand, you know, who it is that we are talking to, the special. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. I mean, I've been in the game for – I'm 35 years old, but uh, I started skating before I was two. So I've been in the game for over 30 years. I uh, played youth hockey in Michigan, played junior hockey in the North American League, a little bit in the USHL, um, Division One at Providence College, Division Three at Curry College, played seven, eight years in the minors and coached in the minor pro ranks. Uh, and I've been coaching junior uh, and youth for about the last six years and just took um, – just took a job with the New Jersey Colonials about four or five months ago, uh, running their tier one program. So that's kind of my background in a nutshell up until uh, current day here. Beauty, beauty. What I love about your background too is that, you know, the, where you came from, right? Like when we talk about the bloodline, obviously you come from a, a family that's been involved in hockey for a long time, you know, in that part. So, you know, there's that part of things, obviously I'd love to, for you to share, but then the other part of, you know, playing for Shattuck, being a Shattuck boy and all that stuff, which we all know at the youth level, getting that influence at a young age between your bloodline and Shattuck to obviously incredible uh, opportunities there and experiences. Talk a little bit about that part, about how that influenced you coming up. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was very, very fortunate growing up in the family that I was able to grow up in and, uh, you know, having my dad and uncles and cousins and grandparents that all played the game, coached the game, uh, you know, were GMs at the NHL level. Uh, you know, I was just surrounded by support. So, um, 
you know, very lucky in, in, in growing up in the atmosphere that I was able to grow up in. And, um, you know, my dad coached me up until I was about 16 years old. And then he realized that, you know, he can't coach me for the rest of my career. And he had to kind of cut those ties. So we found Shattuck St. Mary's and I was recruited by JP Parisi, uh, just a fantastic guy who, uh, you know, kicked off that program. So, um, you know, it's, it's a program that I was very fortunate to, to find. Um, it was a program back then in 99, 2000, that it, it, it isn't, or wasn't what it is today. They had only won one national championship. They were really just getting started. So they were laying the foundation, um, which me coming in at that time and doing what I do now, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to, to go through that, those days and, and being a part of, you know, the foundation at Shattuck and, and laying that foundation and building upon that foundation uh, was a great experience for me and, and one that I am now able to uh, relive on the other side as a coach and, and giving back to these kids and making sure that, that, that our organization, our teams are operating the right way and giving back to kids and, you know, doing things that are going to further develop them as players and most importantly, people. Amen, buddy. Amen. Yeah, it's amazing huh? how like we go through all those uh, sometimes might be challenges or new things when we're younger and we go through. And it's amazing how on the back end of now, as we get older as coaches, as adults, how yep. it comes back, right? Full circle in a lot of ways of where we went through this one experience and now we come back and it's like, holy, like, okay, it was cool that I went through that. Yep. Now I understand for the current position I'm in of how important that is in, in developing a culture. Well, and that's it. I mean, you go through it as a player. So, you, you know, as a, as a kid, as a player, you, you, you go through the game, you go through life, you make mistakes and, and you learn from those mistakes. And now you're able to look back and, you know, you get to thank the Tom Wards and the Mike Eves that, that really made sure that we were being good people that we were working hard, we were competing, we were treating each other the right way. And, uh, you know, that's all, it's really all it's about. If you're, if you're respecting the game, you respect your teammates, your coaches, you have fun, you compete hard, you, anything can happen. And, uh, you know, those are, those are good character traits that uh, are going to help you outside of the game as well. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That was something I want to get into later on, but even right now it kind of like pushes right, right into it. Right. Is that, so culturally, that's a big word. It's a big buzzword, right? That we're all always talking about. We've had a number of conversations about this, right? In different ways. You know, when you look at in today's game compared to, you know, where things were back in the day to now, right? As you're now moving into, you know, your culture and trying to develop your leadership style in there, what are some of the things that you truly just believe in that you've learned from and understand that now moving into this type of position of where you're like, Culturally, these are the things I believe in. This is what I want to see. And here was the influence of that I grew up with coming up of why it was so, so important to me now to be able to have this in my culture. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't uh, – I'm not a guy that puts too many rules on kids or, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that. So first and foremost for me, it's allowing these kids to be creative. Um, you know, there's really four pillars that, that, it, that our program stands on is creativity, open communication, character, and compete. Um, you know, and those, those four words, they vary at, at, at different levels. You know, you look at compete level, your compete level as a squirt is much different than your compete level as a bantam or a midget. You know, a squirt, you're looking at that, you know, how do they, are they skating as hard as they can? Are they working between the whistles? Are they being good teammates? You know, those are the things that are showing good good signs of compete level, uh, of high compete level, or are they banging their stick? Are they giving up on drills? Are they stopping five, five feet short rather than going the extra mile? You know, things like that at the squirt level. So, you know, it's, it, it, they, they vary from age to age, but, you know, you still hold true to, to the idea. Um, so, you know, creativity, open communication, compete and character are four things that, you know, in our program, you, you're certainly going to get all those. And it's, it's about, you know, creating an environment that, that these kids feel safe in, that they feel like they can grow in, they can come, they can ask questions, whether, you know, they, they come, they, if they come to the rink and they have issues at school, they have to be able to feel like that they can communicate that with their coaches. And if they come and they have any outside influences that are weighing them down, get those things off your chest. Let's get it out. Let's air it. 
you know, and, and let's move forward. Because if you're if you're coming to the rink and you're worried about what's going on outside or your grades or this or that, you know, you're not going to be able to focus on what you need to focus on to, to be the best athlete you can. So, you know, open communication to me is key. I want to make sure that these kids feel that they can, you know, they can grow, they can communicate. Um, you know, I, I, I want them to be able to essentially run their, manage their own business someday. So that communication and those communication skills are huge for kids. Yeah, exactly. I love, I love how you put that together too, right? Of where each level is a little bit different. You know, one of the challenges that I know when I had done, you know, directing the program before and then even coaching the coaches, right? I ended up getting involved in the organization was like, hey, can you come coach the coaches? What's some of the stuff when you think about how to implement that into the organization now with the other coaches, right? What kind of strategies have you thought of that have either already been working? Like what kind of plans have you put in place, right? To ensure that everybody's always on the same page and allowed to do that. Cause like, as an example, one of the things that I dealt with as a struggle, right? Was that getting that support always from the top. This is the way I want to get it done. That's it, right? <clears throat> that communication piece was always a struggle, right? Of getting everybody on the same page, getting ownership, getting everyone. So like, from, from your perspective now, what's some of the things that you've, you're walking in, because obviously you have a ton of experience now, you've seen a lot of different things. What's one of the ways or a couple of the ways that you know coming in is like, hey, to, in order to understand each level and progress with things like creativity, because it is different for, uh, you know, a squirt peewee versus a midget, right? Um, or the communication gap, all those different things. What are some of the things that you've thought about to be able to implement, to make it so the coaches and the staff and everybody else on board and, and we'll follow your leadership with that. Yeah, for sure. Well, it, it's funny you bring it up because we're kind of going through it right now currently where, you know, outlining the program and it really is just an outline. It's a step-by-step -step process and, and what, uh, what goals you want to meet at, at, at every particular level, squirt, peewee, banna, midget. Uh, you know, what do you want to knock off the list at squirts? So when they, when they get to peewee, they have, you know, they've got a foundation to where now the peewee coach can say, okay, they can skate, they can stick handle, they can pass. Now we got to learn, uh, you know, we got to teach them a little bit on angling, positioning. You know, we need to enhance their skill sets in this area. So it's really just outlining the program to it's squirt. This is what our focus is. It's, it's skill development. It's fun. It's being a good teammate. If we focus on those things and, and those, those three boxes are checked, now we move them up to the peewee level where we work on a, a different set of criteria because they've already had the foundation built at the squirt level. Now they're going to build the foundation at the peewee level, and it just moves on up. So it's almost a checklist. It's kind of a, a set of goals for our coaches that we want to meet um, or exceed. And if we can meet or exceed them, we understand that our players are going to have a basic foundation transferring up to the next level. Yeah. It's funny. It just really kind of reminded me of something from when I used to work in the rinks. But when you think about it, like in the figure skating world, they lay that out so crystal clear across the yep. board because they test mm -hmm. for it at each stage. Like it almost, you know, you have to pass the test. Right. And it's, it's just interesting. Like, it's great it's, it, because it also, it not only communicates, like the staff is all working on the same thing, but from, especially like what we're trying to do is educate parents, but like, like putting that outward also is that this is what we're trying to teach this season. This is what we want your child to be able to do. And like, including them in the process is so important. But it just totally made me think of that figure skating, because I forget what they call it. That's how I'm involved in <laughs> figure skating. But I remember the different levels and, and it was like, it sounds so similar, which it should, because it's organized and it's structured, but it also allows for creativity and other things. But um, do you guys also communicate to your parents as far as what the, or it's the summer, but like for next season plans to, or so that the parents aren't in the dark, they're included in or anything in that kind of department yeah, yeah. yeah for sure i mean when i when i first took the job the, the the first people i met with were the parents across the board so you know when you get back to the open communication piece within the program um you know the older they get the the parents kind of take a back seat you know when they're 18 17 things like that but you know squirts peewees bantams you know the the parents need to be directly involved so you know having a big organizational parent meeting we're going to have a Kind of a kickoff, uh, a kickoff weekend where we'll bring all the teams in, all the parents, and we'll meet with them uh, individually as groups, as as teams, 
uh, and just lay out the development plan for them. So this is our expectations. Here's what you're going to get. And by the time your your uh, you know son or daughter has gone through a season from August to April, you're going to see this sort of development. You're going to see uh, you know a change from here to here, and you can expect that change. Um, so they're able to evaluate that. And if we aren't able to you know, make a player that, uh, you know, that comes into us and he's an average skater. If we can't enhance those skills, you know, we need to look internally at what we need to do better to, to give back to the kids. And it's, you know, it's all about holding yourself accountable, holding the kids accountable and making sure they're having fun while doing it. So. Love it. Oh yeah. Love it. New, new age, <laughs> new age. Actually. Well, that, that's just it. I mean, even at the highest levels, it's a new age, you know, the, the, the old regime, if you will. And I still think coaching is in the dark ages, but it's, uh, you know, there, it, it's changing, it's evolving. And even at the NHL level, I mean, the, 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 the guys that yell and scream, they, they lose the room, they, they lose the players and, uh, you know, their, their voice is only heard for so long. So, you know, if you if you treat each other with respect, you're you're growing together, you're learning together. You know, it's it's the best atmosphere. Absolutely, and I think in an environment, you know, especially for parents when the kids are younger, and especially for if it's the oldest kid, I because I see it how I am. You know, you don't know, and you're wor Oh, what should I be doing? What's going on? And you know, just a little bit of information goes such a long way to kind of yep. like calm the beast, <laughs> to yep. like kind of keep it. From because we all can be our own worst enemy as parents were what if this happens or what if this or this is this but then it's like when you put yourself out and you're willing to communicate because we hear from people all the time that are like oh we're not we don't talk to parents or whatever and we fight so hard against that because then you're just fighting that battle 24 7 365 year in and year out whereas yeah. if you bring them into the process done by the time they're midgets they trust you it's good it's you know they're yep. like okay the process and it's it's a whole unit rather than just this year in and year out situation what so i you definitely said. applaud you and your organization for that because it's unfortunately rare yeah no it is and it's uh you know again i i've i've just been fortunate enough in my days to play for some very good organizations i've also played for some for some bad coaches for some bad organizations and you learn just as much from the bad organizations as you do from, from the good, from the bad coaches as the good coaches. You know, you, you're always learning in this game, and that's the, that's the greatest part about the game is uh, there's something new and different every day. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it was just a, a thought that, that the more communication we, we can provide the parents, the players, uh, you know, the more education they're getting, and that's what we're here to do is educate the players, educate the parents, and um, we only get the, the players for so long. You know, the parents have the players for longer than we do, so if we can help educate the parents to understand our thought process and understand that it is a process, you're not going to see results, you know, overnight, but here's what we're doing, here's our plan, here's when you can expect to see results, and here's the results you can expect to see. Um, you know, everybody kind of trust the process or, or can start to trust the process when they don't have that information they don't they don't know what to trust uh you know they get kind of lost in their own thoughts and um so educating the parents is a is a, is a big piece for us oh yeah for yourself right have, did you have like a personal evolution throughout the years from the playing days to the coaching days with your take and mindset on parents right because that's one of the things we talk about all the time is that what people don't realize is by practicing things like mindset skills, you can shift your perspective, right? Case in point is I was in that boat back in the day when I first started coaching as well. Juniors, I don't talk to parents. I don't want to deal with them, all that stuff. And I always had this like cold kind of thing that after games, I just walked by them. I didn't want to deal with them because of the headache and all that until, you know, about six years ago, seven years ago, it hit me. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm an idiot. Like, this is stupid. Like I'm making everything harder by not taking on a holistic approach it's about the parents. And in the beginning, that was, a, that was a shift for me because I was one of those coaches that was just like, no, I don't. But in the beginning, I was like, no, you got to talk to them. And then as time goes on, it became natural and easy and all that stuff. So like, talk about, did you have any challenges with that? Or was it pretty seamless? Like, how did you, because like, you're definitely, you're definitely more of like that friendlier character to people that, to everybody. Um, yeah. 
We're like, if I love you, I love you. If I don't like you, you're going to know. <laughs> yeah, bye-bye. <laughs> you're better. You're way better. At yeah, no, for sure. Um, no, no, no. no. It, it, the, the transition period for me was, um, I don't want to say it was short, but it was just a bit different. You know, coming out of being, a, uh, being an assistant coach, a player coach at the minor pro level, you don't, you're dealing with contracts and men and players. Um, so you don't ever deal with parents, uh, coming into the junior world, you know, kids being 17, 18, 19, and 20, the 19 and 20 year olds, you rarely hear from their parents. So you, I was lucky where I only had a couple of younger players at the junior level that, you know, their parents really wanted to be involved. So I was opening in, in talking to them, but they were also, there was probably only a four or five. So I didn't have to manage a whole team of parents. So I was kind of lucky where I came into a, a certain scenario where I didn't have, it wasn't youth. So I didn't have 15 to 20 sets of parents that you have to communicate to. I had four or five. So I was able to manage those, um, those parents a little bit easier that year. So that was my first year of coaching, which was, um, I was very lucky. We had great parents. We had great kids. Uh, and for me, you know, it's, it, I use this with every team, whether it's selects, colonials, pro, youth, college, junior, it doesn't matter what level, but it's all about family. Um, if you create a family atmosphere, you're open to communicating with parents. You know, you, you guys, you guys live it. You've got a, a beautiful family and it, you know, there's trials, there's tribulations, but you have to communicate through those things. And if everybody understands that, you know, we care about our players, we truly want them to be better better players but more importantly better people you know if that communication is there you know you're able to get through some tough times and let's let's be honest hockey is an adverse sport there's going to be adverse situations so as long as everybody is pulling in the same direction and understands you know we're doing our best and the kids are working and they're doing their best and you have that open communication um, you've got your standards set you know it's everybody falls into place I think that's what's so important about your experience, right? Is that adversity piece. Is that understanding of family, right? We, we've talked about this many times before, but that's something also of a shift in perspective, right? Is that realizing that so many families operate under, everyone talks about the family principles, but there's this misconception inside of the industry, right? Or any of the sports industries of where when you say things like family, well, that means then perfect. There's no issues. You love each other. We don't hate each other. Everything's amazing. It's incredible. It's bliss. Where it's going to be further from the truth. Like, yeah, not a chance. Where it's like, I'm going to knock you out. And then the next day, let's <laughs> drink and hang out. And we're okay. Yep. Whereas if it's just a friendship, we, you know, we talk ish to each other. We turn around and it's like, I don't want to talk to you for a while. Maybe never again. <laughs> yep. Whereas with family, it's like, no, like, we get into it with each other because we're passionate. We both have our ideas, but at the end of the day, we still have to figure it out and drive through it. And I think there's nobody better in terms of really understanding that and having the framework of the knowledge of the game, along with truly believing in that type of, you know, mentality and that type of mindset is that, yeah, when it comes to family, this is the way it is. Sometimes some days are going to be great and some days aren't going to be great, but I think that's, what's going to be interesting to, to follow and watch situations that you have to deal with you know in that regard but you know the challenge of i know that somebody for you when it comes to adversity you have that ability and you know and that know how of how to do it it's going to be challenging for you because it's getting other people to understand it's true right have you had those type of situations when you think about that of like where you had to deal with a tough situation where you had to treat a fam you know family like family where you had to come in and do that have you, have you had that experience yet? Um, or can you give an example of that, of where you dealt with that type of situation and it was really hard for you, but you still got through it because it's family. This is the way it goes and this is the way it is. Where you had to, in essence, use your own mindset of, well, I get it. This is the way it needs to be. I, I need to get through this with them and go through it. Have you gone through it without, you don't have to name names, obviously, or anything like that, but have you had those challenges where you went through it? Yeah, definitely. Um you know, and, and it's, you know, it's funny because as a player, I probably would have handled these situations a lot differently uh, and, and kind of reacted on emotion. Oh, yeah. um, but, but you can't do that as a coach. You know, you, you have to understand that, uh, 
you know, you're a leader in every sense of the word and that's what you have to, that's what you have to be. So, um, you got to get outside of yourself, your own, your own thoughts, your own feelings. Sometimes those don't matter. And, and, you know, you really have to adjust your mindset and, and, and deal with certain situations very delicately. But, you know, I've certainly been in, in, you know, a number of those situations where you have to have tough conversations with people that, that you hold close. And, you know, sometimes they, they take those conversations to heart. They listen. Uh, sometimes they don't want to hear the, the tough words. You know, that's the tough, that's the tough thing about nowadays is so many people want to protect kids. You know, they, they, they want to make sure that they give them the, the best opportunity and everything, like you said, is nice and shiny and, uh, you know, easy. That, that's not the game of hockey. You know, it's, you look at the guys that are able to lift the Stanley Cup you know, the amount of adversity that, that they go through through the course of just a season is is crazy. Now, you think about what they've gone through, the, you know, throughout their careers, they're, they're in adverse situations every day. So how do you handle those adverse, those adverse situations? Are you able to get through those situations? Um, are you able to grow from those situations? Or, or, or is adversity something that, that breaks you down? Because if it's something that you can't learn to handle – you're going to, you might have fun in this game, but you know, you're not going to play it for a long time. Eventually it's, it's going to become, it's going to become too difficult for you where you haven't learned how to handle the adversity and you can't get through it. You know, for us, it's about looking adversity right in the face and running right through it. You know, you have to hold your, hold your head high and stick your chest out and just keep going. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not a very forgiving sport, but, you know, if you love it and you, you're able to work through it, you know, there's there's no better sport. There's no better culture. There's no better place to be. That's for sure. Yeah, I would say one of the, the biggest things that I've learned through my mindset journey that relates so much to that is, um, you know, in different depending on who you speak to, they have different words, but it's that dynamic versus fixed mindset. But the big yes. The big thing that I think is so important for all of us, whether we play hockey or whatever it is we do in our lives is you can't out mindset yourself from ever having adversity or tough times or failures or sadness, you know, shit's going to happen regardless. So the thing that's been almost the most soothing to me now is knowing that it doesn't last. It doesn't have to last. Right. You, you accept it for what it is in the moment and yep. move on. And um, I think that, that that for me has been like, okay, it used to be like, I used to be like a, like a doomsday, right? Like, oh my God, the world is ending. The sky is falling. It's over. And now I'm like, okay, it's a bad day or it's a bad shift or it's a bad game. It doesn't mean it's a bad life. It doesn't mean that it's just over from there and, and having the opportunity to just be open to learning that and learning that, you know, if you're going to be fixed, then all you're going to see is that you're not going to think there's any possible way for it to end any other way than just what's right in front of you. But if you can just take a step back, different perspective and realize that it's just, it's just a moment in time of your life. That's it. It, it doesn't have to be this downward spiral, but um, I just wanted to bring that up because it, it reminded me of that because you can't, whether it's hockey or whatever it is you do, if you play the piano, like it doesn't matter. Yep. Something's going to, at some point or another, no one lives a perfect life. But if they're telling you it's BS, is that happening so right. exactly like i think really how many how many times we've talked about this of where it's it's counterintuitive by nature right like we talk about all the time of how if the game is played mostly without the puck why do we spend so much time on playing with the puck right because we know that majority of it 95 percent, is actually what you do away not with but we spend 95 percent of our time with not without and so it's the same thing with adversity, right? Of where that concept, that mindset that you can, hey, it's an attitude. It's like, hey, like, it's not always easy, right? It's not always easy to practice adversity, but you can actually practice that skill. And I think it's the same thing that you see at the youth realm of where what happens is we don't realize adversity is what shapes you, what actually builds you into strong character later on. The adversity is actually what 95% of this is to get through. Yes. I, that's the biggest part. And everyone deals with it. Even the rock stars are dealing with the same type of adversity that people generally tend to think that that doesn't exist when the reality is we all know, you know, it does. We've been yep. fortunate when we work with those players and we know they put 
as much or if not more pressure on themselves that even when they're doing great, they're creating their own adversity. Like it's, it's yep. wild to watch. So it's, it's interesting, right? When you see that perspective of how inside of an organization, being able to lead and do that, of being mindful of that, I think is so powerful, you know, as an organizational leader, because it's all going to stem from how you're dealing with the adversity and how then you're going to turn around and create right inside the culture for everybody to feel that same feeling behind it and go, it's all right, we're learning, we're getting better at it. But adversity is such an important counterintuitive energy that people think, well, it's only something you practice a little bit. No, it's actually something you have to be ready for that's going to happen 90, 95% of the season. Yep. It's just every day. But if you go in eyes wide open and realize that's the way it's always going to be, you're going to learn so much and see that adversity is actually good. It's positive. Yep. It's a good thing. It's not this bad word that a lot of times we naturally want to be protective and, you know, protect the kids and be safe. And that's the, you know, that's the duality that we all have to deal with and go through that. Well, and that's just it. It's, it's about creating the environment and making sure you have coaches in place that, that, um, that can help build that culture and, and preach those things. You know, when you, when our kids are making mistakes, you know, do, do you scream at them and sit them for five shifts or do you, do you break the mistake down and, and give them other options and, and work on things during practice that can be related back to that exact play? Um, you know, are, are, you, are you doing those things? And, you know, we have to have people in place and we've been fortunate, very fortunate to bring in some great guys here this year um, that, that, that have that culture that, that, uh, you know, that create that atmosphere. They're great communicators. They, they love the creative side of the game. They want kids to make mistakes and they understand that through our mistakes, we grow. Um, and, and obviously there's different focuses at different, there's a different focus at different levels. Um, you know, the older you get, you, you, you start to, not that wins are everything, but when, you know, midget hockey is midget hockey, you're, you're competing, you're, you're trying to put out a successful product and, um, you know, but at the youth level, it's, it's about, it's just about developing their skills and their mindset. So when they get to those older ages, junior college, and you have to, you know, you have to perform to play, you know, they're able to, to get through adverse times. They're able to have confidence in themselves to be able to make plays. Um, so when they get to that level, they, they step up. Um, but it's about, you know, creating that atmosphere that allows them to, to develop from, you know, eight years old all the way up to 18. Yeah, exactly. I think what's really important about what you said there and for our parents watching and even coaches that are watching as well, when you talk about the, the idea of making mistakes, right? Like, and I'd love to know your personal take on it of how you're dealing with it, right? But for me personally, that's something that I've truly believed in now for years, right? Where I, I knew it, this is what it is, right? But I've only been, you know, in essence, you know, mindsetting myself over the last three years. So as an example, I've been getting better at when I'm in those situations where a player makes a key mistake to just know my initial reaction is oh, because it's like the, the compete side of me kicks in naturally, right? We're all unconscious beings. And there's a big part that we always talk about. You're not going to, you're not going to stop feeling those feelings. And I think that's a big part that inside of our culture where coaches struggle with that of understanding that you're still going to have that feeling that's going to surface and come up. But it's about how you are aware of that feeling and catch it as it comes in and then quickly realize, all right, change direction because I know this is what's most important for the player. And so I've been getting a lot better at it. I'm not great at it still yet. I think I'm definitely good at it of where I go through it and I understand and I feel it surface and it sits right here. And I'm not like, all right, it's all right, buddy. Get back in. You know, I just kind of like, hey, listen, you know, I'm still in that mode. And it's, it's cleaning up. But I'd love to hear how how do you how are you dealing with it or how are you finding yourself initially wanting to do you have an initial uh and then stopping yourself or is it just when you're out there it's just kind of like you feel it of hey when I go in I know who I'm dealing with like as it's easy for me when I go out on the ice with squirts and peewees it doesn't even surface it's more dealing with it when I'm with the band of midget crew of where yeah. you really have to because you have higher expectation I guess from them. But yep. I hear your take on it of how does it sit with you? Is it something 
more natural like yeah and you feel my first couple of years coaching it was it was it was difficult right because especially with the older kids you just expect them to be able to perform and, and oh, yeah. when they can't when they can't perform something that you think may be simple it, it, it you struggle in communicating that initially so you know as a coach you have to break down every detail so if they can't execute something you have to show them how to and why they're not currently and what they need to change to be able to execute that movement or that play or, or whatever it is. And if in the moment as a coach, you're allowing your mindset to flip and say, what the whatever, you're not, you don't have the ability to break it down and communicate it and, and teach. Um, so, you know, for me, honestly, what, what, what helped me was officials. I used to be so bad with officials and my focus was on a bad call or a missed play or this or that. And I, I, I would be constantly behind the play because I was worried about the official and it took me a year. And, uh, you know, I had a guy that, uh, that was my GM when I was a first year head coach and, and Glenn Hefferin and, uh, Glenn does a ton in the district. And I was very fortunate to work with him and, you know, he, he really worked on my mindset with officials and you know i i grew up with officials in my family so i was used to a certain standard right like my uh you know everybody knows bill mccurry with the big bushy mustaches in the hall of fame and all that stuff so that was my standard as a kid which you know was, was good but you know when you got older you expected everybody to be like uncle bill <laughs> good luck um so you know my mindset really shifted that year and i think it was my second year where uh my second year coaching you know I had no issues with officials and ever since then it, it really helped me focus on my players and focus on the teaching aspect of the game and instead of letting my my own competitive nature come out and and affect the team on a negative basis or maybe just not even help them at all which as a coach you always need to be teaching you always need to be driving your team forward uh, developing them so you, if you're not doing that you know, you have to take a look internally at, at what you can do to, to fix your mindset, to be able to communicate those things so that the players, you know, benefit. Yeah, exactly. I would say that translates to perfectly for parents also. Like, everyone's a great Monday morning quarterback. It's so easy to sit in the stands and watch a play unfold and pick out mistakes, but you're not out yeah. doing it. So I think it's just like a great thing for parents to realize too. Like, of course there's that natural cause you're watching it. Like you're, you, you know, you're going to have that unconscious being like, you're watching a mistake happen. You're watching, but yep. you have to remember too, like, well, if you could put some skates on and I don't mean you guys as coaches, but I mean like us parents on the bench, we're like, I can barely skate. So like, I, who am I to say, great, you made a mistake, but like, uh, I don't know. Like if I was out there, I'd be a lot worse. Yeah. I think for parents too, it's important. Like that's a great lesson of what you guys are talking about that can be applied so much more than just coaches. Like right. I think parents can realize that, trust me, your kid knows when they make the mistake. Oh, yeah. You don't need to berate them about it later on. You know, if you yeah. either really bummed out about it, check in with them. If, you know, if it looks like maybe they, they did get, you know, yelled at or whatever it is, like be there for them. You don't need to be another layer of, like announcer of like <laughs> tell yep. what they did wrong and fully like oh i'm sure they're fully attuned so that there was a mistake made so um you know we all sit in the stands and we're like we're yelling and we're, we're being fans but they're kids so i think it's a lesson that translates really well to parents too yeah exactly yeah and, and, and what i tell all my players and coaches and, and parents alike is it's it's not the it's not the mistake that defines you as a player it's how you make up for that mistake. So if you right. turn the puck over, do you throw your stick in the air and get off the ice? Or do you stop, go get the puck back, give it to your teammate? You know, how do you make up for what you just did? Is, is there extra effort there? Or do you just kind of give up on the play? Um, you know, to me, it's how you make up for the mistake that, that is of greater value than the actual mistake itself. So if you can continue to preach that, you know, and, and the kids understand that, it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to, it's okay to mess up, but I have to respond to that mistake. I have to work harder to make up for that mistake. You know, that that's when kids understand mistakes are okay. We just have to continue to work through them. Exactly. And I think what one thing to point out that you said, right, is that consistent messaging is bringing that up because that's what ends up happening at the competitive layers of this whole scenario, right? Is that 
we want to start focusing more on the wins and eventually, oh my God, we're we're making mistakes. Like one of the things that we discussed the other day, we talked about how the irony is, is that if you have a good organization, you have good players, you're automatically going to be one of the top teams out there. So when you have, when you're surrounding the culture by people that believe in your culture and are doing that, yeah, you're going to make mistakes, but the wins ultimately, we all know at the youth level, he who has the best player wins. Like it's just the way it goes. Like, you know, nothing against you on that, although you probably do really well coaching-wise. But if I pull together all the best kids right now and say, here, you take the bench and go, you can't skate, you can't do any stuff, but I guarantee you, you're going to be in the top ten. <laughs> probably, actually, you'll probably get to go into probably top five with these kids. <laughs> because that's the youth level. But at the juniors and higher, it doesn't work like that anymore. It's just the way yeah. it goes. But the consistency of the message is where I think a lot of coaches and, and parents fall short because we talk about high percentage plays. What really matters the most? And the word mistakes, allowing mistakes, working through, getting angry over mistakes, right? Over the course of a season and parent, coach, players, teammates, everybody. And it's such a like big part of it where mistakes is just a communication. Mistakes is another one of those high percentage mindsets that it's like, we have to think about this over and over and talk about it over and over and not allow our emotions to get over us because we're in here in a six month process. That one mistake that I'm making in September could be a huge difference maker that because you allowed me to just keep working through it and we're in March and we're in a big game or whatever it is, because you allowed me to work through it all those months, it gave me the confidence to allow those mistakes. Then when it really meant something later on, now I have the confidence to do it as opposed to how many, you know, how many creative outlets or, you know, the, the idea of the belief I can do it, get crushed because it happens where whether it's the coach crushes it the parent crushes it in the car your teammate crushes it or you crush it yourself where you just say i can't believe i messed up that's where things medical that's where things really get messed up inside of it you there billy yours yeah there we go yeah that that's where a lot of things really get messed up inside the process you know where people don't realize that right of you got to allow it to happen, but then how are you handling it? How's the parent handling? How's the family? These are the challenges that we all face that we have to be mindful of as we work through that process. So it's easy for us to say, yes, we believe culturally in not uh, in allowing mistakes, but it's a whole nother thing of actually working through that process and allowing it to happen is a whole nother animal that takes so much sensitivity, so much awareness, so much consistent messaging to work through in managing it that, it's just something that I think pointing it out, the appreciation of it and for people watching to understand that it's, we say it, we've seen the memes, we've seen the quotes and we get it, but it's such a big thing that I wanted to point this out because I know how much of a believer you are in it and how much culturally that benefit in your organization to allow that to happen and to talk with coaches and parents is, it's not something that we raise up enough and talk about it in this context enough because it's not easy to do but we know the benefit of it in the long term is basically what I want to get out there. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, again, it's, it's a process. So to be able to work through your mistakes as a squirt and a peewee and a bantam, you, you know, now you've got those, the, those, that confidence and you've got the skill sets too, as a midget and a junior hockey player and into college, now you're able to, to execute those movements or those plays or whatever it is that, that you were, you know, essentially allowed to grow into as a youth hockey player, you know, for, you know, Vince, I mean, at, at, at some point in your hockey career, the fun takes a back seat and now it's a job. Yeah. Now that is starting to happen earlier and earlier for kids. And we wonder why we're losing players at 16, 17 and 18 years old, because we're putting an emphasis on this is a job and, Trust me, I've, I've said it my first couple of years coaching too. I caught myself saying it last weekend to 11-year-olds, go out and do your job. Well, you know, when you're talking to 11-year-olds, well, what is your job? Okay, let's break that down. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, but um, you know, there, there, there comes a point where it does become a job and, and it is performance-based. Um, but you can't have that for 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14-year-olds. Um, so you have to allow them – to, to grow into themselves, you have to allow them to make mistakes, be creative, 
uh, you know, and, and teach through those mistakes. I mean, there's no better teaching point than when a player makes a mistake for a coach to be able to go over and analyze that mistake, break it down, give them different options and spin that mistake into a positive. Um, because that's what continues to, that's what allows the kids to develop. That's what continues to, to grow the game because they're having fun. They, they want to continue to play. They're not afraid of making mistakes. Um, and when it, it, when it does come time for them to have to perform for their job, you know, they're confident. They have those abilities because they've been allowed to do it. They've had coaches that have, that have implemented that into their, into their psyche, if you will, that, you know, it's okay. It's okay to be creative. It's okay to make plays. And if something happens, I just got to make up for it. Yeah, exactly. That, that's one of the toughest struggles that I'll always have from a performance coaching standpoint, right? Is that getting a player to understand a high percentage play that's like, hey, yeah, you're going to make mistakes at it now, but at the junior USHL, NA, whatever it is, you know, you go into that level, college level, at that level, that's going to be a huge skill. That's going to be a huge asset for you down the line. And because of at your age now, we got to work through it. But then when you have a coach that doesn't allow them to work through it, that's where the disconnect starts to happen is where, well, if I make a mistake, he's going to yell at me. And that's where the toughest part of where we're managing it of where, well, you can work on this in practice. You can work on this by visualizing at home, working on it on your own game. You, you want to pick out the times when you can actually use it. But that's one of the biggest challenges I'm always facing is that when you're trying to help them understand that even though you're making that mistake now, the value of what that habit is, you have to keep putting the time into it versus when they're on a team that doesn't allow them to explore that. That's, it's such a huge challenge, right, that we all face and that we're always dealing with. That, again, brings it back to that adversity piece. But that, what's you know, awesome about your concept and your philosophy of when they're younger, that's where it's all built. Ultimately, at the end of the day, that influence starts from when they're younger. So the more we can influence parents, coaches, players to allow that to happen when they're younger, then when they're older, they have the confidence, they have the ability to adjust to maybe a tougher coach and say, all right, all right, I get it. It's, it's the way it is. You know, you're, you're a boss in terms of the team. You lead the ship. I got to listen to that. But then how can I adjust my game to still do my thing, my flavor, but still make you happy because I know that's the way it is. I, I think that that's a big piece that we miss is that we think in cultures it's about being tough when the reality is no, it's the reverse of when they're younger. If we allow them to open their minds to that creativity, later on you can be tougher on them because they've gone yep. through diverse in the beginning and we're allowed to make mistakes, have fun through it, understand that okay, certain things I can do, certain things I can't. I'm a part of a team. That makes it a lot easier when you're open and honest and with the communication part on that versus later on. I think it makes a huge difference inside of cultures when you do that. Yeah, for sure. And you just sparked a, another thought in saying it's, you know, you're a part of a team. You can't ever as an individual put yourself before the program. You know, the program is always the most important piece. And, as a, as a player, you're never bigger than the program. And, you know, going back to my days at Shattuck, I mean, my, my line mate was Zach Parisi my last year there. He was treated just like everybody else. He treated everybody just like, every, you know, he would treat his parents and, you know, didn't have a C or an A on his chest. Everybody knew who our captain was. Everybody knew who our leader was. But, you know, it's, it's a program that, that, that preaches uh, – you know, the program is bigger than any individual. Um, and, and if you're doing that and kids understand that, you know, they have to fall into a team atmosphere and, and they work for each other and they play for each other. Um, you know, again, it's, it's about, it's just about building the culture for these kids to grow and continue to develop in the game. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it, developing through mistakes and understanding that, that there's a, there's a bigger picture out there and that you're a part of a team and, you know, we're not just building hockey players, we're building athletes, uh, or excuse me, we're building people. Um, you know, when they're done with their athletic endeavors, they're going to go off and they're going to be police officers, lawyers, doctors, educators, you know, how are they working? What are they teaching? Um, things like that. So it's, uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. It's been certainly a, the beginning of a process, but, uh, you know, guys like you, Vin, you know, you continue to, you guys both continue to spread the, the good word and what's, uh, what's best for kids out there today and, 
you know, people like you are going to continue to help guys like me, you know, spread that message. So, um, so I have something neither of you probably talked about and thank you so <laughs> yeah, much for that. that. But if it's okay with you, I'd like to have a little fun here. I have like five. I like fun, Marissa. A little fun, a little bit fun. Um, I have like five hot seat rapid fire questions. So I'm just going to ask them to you. And then like whatever pops in your head, just go with it. Let's go. Okay, cool. All right. I'll start um, easy. Like what's the favorite rink you've played, either played or coached in? Favorite rink played or coached in? Um, I would have to say University of New Hampshire's rink. I love playing there on the road. Um, what's your favorite memory as a player? Pro, youth, doesn't matter. Favorite memory as a player, winning a national championship with Shattuck in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's awesome. I love how I write your answers down. Like, I'm like, <laughs> um, what's your most embarrassing moment as a player or a coach? Most embarrassing moment? Yeah, it could be kid, youth, whatever. Um, most embarrassing moment was I told my dad to shut up when he was coaching. And he made me crawl off the ice. I had to crawl all the way around from the bench all the way to the, to the stand side where the locker rooms were. And when I got – and I had to crawl because it was all cement, so I couldn't walk. And when I got halfway there, all the moms came running over, and I was in tears, and they were yelling at my dad. And <laughs> <laughs> so that was my most embarrassing moment. Cool. That's old school right there. <laughs> yeah. That is definitely old school. Um, Biggest aha moment. Biggest aha moment. Um, I would say when I was when I was recruited to Providence, when they told me the reason that they decided to commit to me was a big aha moment. I was in my last year as a twenty year old playing in the North American League. I had one more year to you know to prove that I could play Division One hockey. Was going into the biggest tournament of the year that, that kicked off the season. So I wanted to have a, a good, a good showing. And my first couple games, I came out of the gate hot and I think I was leading the weekend in scoring. So I had a bunch of teams coming to, to watch me the last game and put a lot of pressure on myself. And I broke my ankle uh, in the first period and it was across the ice from the benches. And I, uh, I went down and I knew my ankle had snapped. I couldn't stand on it, but I, I wouldn't stay down. I just kept getting up, kept falling, kept, you know, crawling over to the bench. And when uh, Rick Bennett, who's now at Union, told me, you know, the moment I saw you not allow yourself to be defeated and you just kept crawling to the bench and wanting to get over to your team and you wouldn't let anything keep you down, he said, that's when I knew that, you know, I wanted you on my team. So it was, it was an aha moment because it had nothing to do with my skill it was my want to that put me over the top. That's sick. And then finally, if you could wave a magic wand and change one thing in the game today, youth pro doesn't matter what would it be. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. Um, Rule is it whatever? Like you know anything. I think for youth hockey, wave a wand and let's play three on three. I think it would develop players more. I think you're you're getting more goaltenders involved if you have if you have smaller teams. Now you're putting a focus on developing goaltenders instead of one goalie playing 20 games, the other goalie playing you know 10 or 15. Um, I think at the youth levels, just be three on three, no contact, skill, open ice. Let's have some fun. Yeah, I'm curious, three v three, that you coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Sponsored by Bloodline. Sign. <laughs> Rapid shot questions. You did good. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I like them. Those are tough. Thought we'd have a little fun. Yeah, I know. I'm saying I was like, oh man, are these going to be thrown at me? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not about you today. It's I was just, about yeah, okay, just sure. <laughs> I was just hoping Vince didn't make the questions. Yeah. <laughs> mm, I can't come up with that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. No, it's um. Tie it, just tie it up here. No, it was awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. Like. Obviously, you know, the big reason of bringing you on, right? And, and, and by the way, I love that rule at the end, right? It's so funny, right? Because you know there's parents and traditionalists that are listening to that and 
it's going right over their head. They're of clenching like, their pearls. Yeah, they're like, how, how could you do that? Oh my God. Again, this always comes back to, and the reason why I'm such a huge fan of yours and all that is, you know, we've talked about it so many different times, right? About how the game needs to change. And we need to think more in development mode, not in winning mode, which is still what majority of the game does. It's just, you can't leave it. It's, it's hard to get out of it. But what you just said was development mode of what does it hurt anybody from six to even 10 years old for four years to say, we're just going to do three or three the whole time. What does it hurt? It hurts nothing because once they turn 11, 12, you can get into all that other stuff easily. And, but developmentally, what you just talked about, uh, people think, but what about offsides? What about all these other things in the game? How can you learn that later on? It's like, you can easily learn that later on. And that's what I love about the mindset that you bring and the philosophy when you talk about new age coach and all that is it's refreshing. You know, it's, it's inspirational because the reality is we need more guys thinking outside the box to change it and realize there's more to this game than just the winning aspect of it. There's a development, there's a life component, there's all those components. And if we actually use what science shows us and what our intuition tells us and all these other things, it'd be amazing how much would change fast. But the old guard is the old guard and a lot of people are, it's, it's hard to leave that old mindset and all that stuff because it takes a lot of work. In the beginning, it takes a lot of work. On the back end though, what in, but in the beginning, once you see the results, then it's like, wow, okay, we can change it. But that's one of the things that, you know, a huge proponent of yours, you know, love you as a brother, as a friend and all that stuff. But, you know, the bigger part obviously is that the work that you're doing, the fact that now you're running this organization is awesome because what an opportunity to lead and show the rest and everybody else that, hey, what we have here, it's working, it's going, and more people will listen to that when they see that one of the best is out there running these type of, this type of philosophy. We can implement that too. And, and we can do that just as easily as they do it. So it's awesome to watch and, and see how yeah. right now. No, I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, obviously very, very blessed to be able to do, uh, you know, what I do. And I'm just a, you know, I'm a hockey purist. There's, I don't, there's nothing else I want to know. There's nothing else I care to know. This is what I've done every day in my life. And, you know, extremely blessed to, to have this opportunity. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, good players are good players, and those guys are going to go on to, to do whatever they're going to do in the game. Um, you know, and we'll be watching those guys on TV someday. But, uh, you know, for me, it's about it's about helping the game as a whole. Um, you know, so it's it's about keeping keeping kids in the game for as long as possible, making sure that they're reaching their highest levels, whether that's Division One club, Junior A, Junior B, U18, college, Division Three, whatever it is, you know, they just they have to have a good experience. Um, they have to they have to play for an organization that they know you know cares about them, wants to develop their their skills on the ice, their skills as people off the ice, um, you know, in a, a place that they can go and have fun as a kid. So, um, you know, just extremely blessed and and love, love what I do and uh, wouldn't want to do anything else. So, you know, want to, want to obviously uh, do more work with, with the Maltzes and appreciate you guys bringing, bringing me on here. And anytime I can be of help, you know, I'm here. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. If you guys really enjoyed what Billy had to say, their conversation, please share, hit like so that we can help spread the message out to all <laughs> youth hockey sports oh, yeah. whatever it is but you know we want to really get the word out there so please hit share hit like we thank you so much for joining us today yeah. follow coach billy on facebook guys puts up stuff cool stuff all the time and again just pay attention as much as you can because i know the colonials are fortunate to have it it's going to be interesting to see as time goes on to see how much more they're going to develop overall with what you got there absolutely yeah thanks guys we're excited you're welcome beauty have a good day, everybody. All right, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Talk to you guys later. Later. Bye. Bye.